Counting the cost of immigration. Yep, we're gonna talk about the movie Minari. Minari. So, uh, how was your how was your impression of the movie? It was pretty interesting. I thought the way that they built up the different characters to say different things was really interesting. Like the difference in perspective from the husband and the wife and the grandmother and the kids, I, I felt was really realistic. Mm. You know, I, I noticed some Americans, English speakers saying that Korean movies are very fascinating. It's very fast paced. It doesn't have filthy, like, like dirty, like sexual things going on. Uh, I mean, not as much as regular typical American movies or dramas would, would normally contain. So, so how would you, what's your uh, general assumption or impression of Korean dramas or movies? I think I would probably agree with that for the most part. Um, I tend to enjoy Korean films and movies and TV shows, all those things. Um, a lot of that is because of that. You know, oh. you can find stuff on a bunch of different topics that's a little bit safer to watch. I guess is the way to put it. <laughs> you have to do a lot of research on my films, but usually if it's a foreign film, I'm a little less worried. Oh, I see. Yeah, because the movie Parasite, I never watched it. I just saw the promo video and I don't like the director. He, I don't know if he, like, I mean, the, 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 the different movie that he made, the Bong Juno, the director, was Okja. It was talking about like, 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 like gen genetically modified animal industry or something. Like the one like, kind of like, the, some kind of like a monster looking like pig mm -hmm. was there and the child actor was there and then foreigners were there and it's kind of similar and then like they were cursing all over the places and there was a child actor i'm just like what kind of nonsense is this like why why do adults like have to say all these dirty filthy like things like and then there's a child actor the child actor is gonna watch that and they say yeah this is they should be watched like 13 years old up or something like i don't get that like mm -hmm. adults create industries where children are going to end up become victims of the immoral culture so and people say yeah it's a great movie but i don't really agree with that kind of like careless mindset yeah i think that for what i've heard different studios and different directors will take different approaches to shielding their child actors from different things. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, but I think that not long ago I read an interview about a movie that was a horror film that had um, child actors in it, and the child actors had no idea they were making a horror film. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 10 or 20 years, we'll go back and find out, and it'll be kind of instructive and painful possibly yeah um, I don't, I don't, yeah whereas there are other kids times when like the kids know exactly what they're doing and they're totally there for it um i think parents have to do a lot to take care of their kids and i think sometimes pushing them into an industry where they are working is really damaging um, but I know that there are some kids who really love to be involved with acting in film and, you know, they'll push their parents that direction too. Yeah. Um, it's definitely complicated. Yeah, I mean, they, they're gonna, they may become popular a few years, but, you know, the Home Alone actor, he ended up becoming a drug addict, addict, and I heard that his parents got divorced over the money that he made or something like that, so... I think I heard a similar thing. Yeah, it's not enough to abuse children to make money for themselves. Yeah, I don't think the uh, movie industry should like be built upon our greed only, even though it's a money-making yeah. industry. So, um, 
So other than the uh, morality uh, aspect, uh, were you able to um, relate to the immigration aspect as, a, as an American? Um, I have a couple of different perspectives on it. Um, I've lived in another country for a while, and so I could kind of compare it to some of my experiences there. But I think that probably the Korean family in the film had a much harder time than I did. Um, and I think also it kind of fits with when my parents moved to Africa. Um, they kind of had similar experiences there, but again, I think that it was easier and better for them than it was <laughs> for this family. Um, I think that one of the things that I've become very aware of, especially in my travels, is that I have white privilege, a lot of it, you know, and I come from a culture that most people in the world recognize and understand and know something about. You know, no matter where I go in the world, I'm probably going to find someone who can speak English and I can just feel comfortable speaking my own language and doing my own thing. And, you know, I can expect people to kind of make way for me. Whereas, you know, if you come from another culture and you come to America, you'll probably be treated much differently. Like what you saw in the film when they went to church and everybody was kind of, especially the kids, were treating them very insensitively. And, um, you know, I read a study not long ago that said America is probably the least racist country that there is. But that doesn't mean you don't experience racism here. It just means that we have to deal with our problems more often because we have such a mixture. You know, when I, when I first went to America, people talked about racism. But the way I looked at it is that, I mean, you can say some people are racist, but I think... I mean, the, the way they, the, the, the children were engaged to each other um, could be seen as a racist remark and she had to deal with it. But to me, I never considered myself as a victim, in a sense. And mm. I just uh, figured, out a way, I figured out a way to make friends with people. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm a foreigner. I'm not a citizen there. So obviously, I'm an outsider. So I had to work extra hard to fit, fit in. And that takes a lot of work. And it takes, I mean, th that goes the same way. It goes the same way in any kind of relationship. You, if you want to fit in. And if you, they, they don't know you, it takes a lot of work. So to me, I just uh, prepared a bunch of jokes, <laughs> thought about a bunch of fu funny things they would enjoy so, I can, they, can, so they can like me. So, um, I don't, I mean, she was like, she was like, the, the, she was doing like ching ching chong or like she was saying all kinds of like foreign languages. So like those people that are always thinking they're, they're victims, they can see that as, oh, she's making fun of me. But to me, it was more of an innocent attempt to try to understand a foreigner. But I guess it's, it, it depends on how you look at it. But I think the more you look at yourself as a victim, is going to be more perpetuated in your mind. So, 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 um, pretty much to me, um, I never, I've never felt treated badly because I wasn't, I was a foreigner. Even if they were doing that, I never believed the lie. I believe that people are, uh, genuinely a little bit more respectful so I guess that's the way I, I treated people so I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to reciprocate that mentality even if there was and so to me that's how I dealt with it so you said so did you live in Africa for a long time or you just your parents well my family did um I was born there but I left pretty young oh I see yeah so when you were mm -hmm. when you were in a foreign country how did you deal with the a sense of alienation or something like that? Well, I guess it's kind of similar to what you said. I mean, I expected it to be different. And so I wasn't really put off by the fact that it was different. Um, I traveled around in Australia and Fiji with my sister just before I left Korea. And it seemed like every five minutes my sister would say, well, this is weird, or I don't understand this, or this is so different from what I'm used to. 
And it was kind of off-putting for me at first because, for me, like, it was supposed to be weird. It was supposed to be expected, and so there was, like, no point in pointing it out. You know, that's just the deal. And um, I think that, actually, for me, going back to the U.S. was more difficult for me than leaving (laughs) because when I, I went to Korea, I knew things would be different, and I was expecting them to be. You know, I wasn't expecting the food or the people or the culture to be the same, like, at all. And so I was always looking for and surprised by the similarities. Because I think the more I travel, the more I see that people are pretty much the same everywhere. You know, they have the same goals. They have the same desires. They have the same needs. Um, But for me, going back to the U.S. was really challenging because, you know, I was different. And I was expecting everything to be the same as it was when I left, and it wasn't. And I think that's something that people don't generally talk about. You know, when you travel and you go have these experiences, you know, they say you can't really go back home, and I think that that's true. So America has changed by the time you came back. Yeah, and also I had changed a lot. Uh, I guess you became more flexible and understanding. Yeah, I think so. And then, I guess, when you went back, I guess, did you feel it was more rigid? Yeah, in, in many, especially like where I live now, um, the school that I work at has the force of traditions for more than 100 years. You know, the thing is they've always done the same way over and over again. And, like, I accept that and respect it but also I'm used to having to kind of do things differently um one of the things that really surprised me about coming back here was working with other people because when I was in Korea I had a great team of people in the English department but we didn't really do much with any other department and we'd get you know messages and emails and we'd go to meetings but you know we didn't understand a good portion of what was going on in the emails and the meetings. And so we just sort of got used to doing things on our own and making our own plans and just sort of being flexible with whatever unexpected thing happens. And then I came here and, you know, the principal expects me to clue them in on things that I want to do and why I want to do them. And, <laughs> you know, it's I have to stop and think and be, wait a second, all right, I've got someone I need to talk to before I just run off with it. It's, And so I guess in a way it does feel a little bit more rigid to me, but not really because mindsets are rigid so much as just systems are more rigid. Yeah, I guess, I guess you had more autonomy here, ironically speaking, but I guess over there you you have to get a bunch of things approved before you do anything. Yep. And I think that remembering the experiences that I know you and some of the other teachers I worked with had you probably experienced a lot more rigidity in the system than I did. Exactly. I felt like I was yeah, choked. I was being choked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wouldn't be very surprised if you came and worked at a school here and you didn't have as many restrictions as I do because you're not really in the system the way that I am. Oh, that's true. Like, there's a great benefit sometimes to being an outsider. That's very true. No, they, don't, they don't expect like, you to uphold the same standard. Yeah. And so you can kind of set your own standard, which is kind of nice. <laughs> hey, hold on. Let me, let me go to the bathroom. I'll, I'll, I'll be back. Sure. So we just talked about um, what it means to live as an, as an outsider and insider. And so... Uh, who, which character in the movie did you relate the most to the most? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say that I related to all of them in different ways. Okay. Which probably means I didn't really relate to any of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. Like, I, I appreciated the, the vision that the father had, you know, to want to try to do something that was outside and not in a factory doing, like, really mindless, boring work. Because, you know, that was the reasons why I wanted to go into teaching. 
is that, you know, it gives you something different to think about every day. And there are different challenges. You don't, you know, get stuck in a rut doing the exact same thing. Um, that was important to me when I was choosing my career. Um, but then also, I understand the wife's need for stability and for knowing what's going to happen in the future and for relying on something that's more stable than just, you know, here's what the weather's going to be like today. And I think in some ways, like, she was kind of proven right by that because, like, unexpected things happened throughout the movie that really made things more challenging for the family. And um, this is probably going to sound strange, but I'm a very cautious person. I don't like to take risks. And um, following, I guess, a spouse across the country to take a risk like that I think would have been as difficult for me as it was for her. Um, and I guess I can also relate a bit to the kids, you know, the older kid trying to take care of her younger brother. And like, if you've ever read the birth order book, she was like a textbook oldest child, you know? <laughs> and, um, even though I'm the younger sister in my family, I kind of feel a connection to that because I always felt like the oldest sibling. And, um... I always kind of felt the responsibility to follow the rules and make sure everyone else is following the rules. <laughs> and so I did myself there. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I can continue, but I guess those are the ones I'm closest to. I mean, you're the youngest, and how, how come you felt like you were the oldest somehow? Uh, I have a very different perspective on the world than my sister does. Okay. Um, my sister is about four years older than I am, and she's much more this the school of, I'm going to try this out for myself to see if this works, as opposed to, I'm going to do some research, I'm going to test this out, I'm going to figure out whether it's going to work before I try it, which is the way that I would do things. And so I felt a lot when I was younger, like I was trying to like, convince her not to make choices that I could see were not going to be good ones. <laughs> um, when it comes to like dating and relationships, oh, you know, I, I was always like, slow down. Don't go that direction. That guy's not going to be great for you. <laughs> um, my parents told me a couple of years ago that they felt like when we were teenagers, they were always trying to convince my sister to stop um, dating and trying to convince me to start. And that's just sort of how it's always been with my sister and me. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're more of a stickler of the norm or the standard or the rules or the law and then your sister was more of a risk taker or liberal. <laughs> yeah. I see. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's a miracle I ever ended up overseas. Is that what? I said it's a miracle I ever ended up overseas. Oh, that's true. You, 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 you know, that's not... Yeah. You took a bunch of risks. It's not the start of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that helped me to grow in a lot of different ways. Because I think sometimes risks are necessary. That's pretty true. And um, I think going to Korea helped me to learn that. And oh, that's, that's something awesome. I'm really glad that I have learned. Wow. Yes, because I'm envisioning farming in the future, but I'm not gonna like start farming like after abandoning my current career. I'm gonna start small and then slowly transition, transition, or keep it as a hobby and then see how it goes. And when I looked at Child. the movie. Yeah, like when I looked at the movie, I'm just like, wow, that's my story. And I, I typically don't watch movies because of the reasons I already mentioned. I don't want to watch filthy images that I don't want, I, I, that will force me to keep thinking about for days and for months. So I don't want to see anything that I would end up regretting uh, later on. So I usually typically don't watch movies. And, and they say curse words all the time, and I don't like to hear stuff like that. And actors and actresses, they always get involved in physical intimacy, which I don't really approve. I don't think they should be doing that just to make money. 
Um, but, but anyway, so when I looked at the father doing it, and when I looked at a bunch of reviews, I just realized this director is very different. He made it <clears throat> from a moral, religious like perspective. He 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 was very he seemed very different. So I I tried it and I didn't really see anything. Um, moral there throughout the whole movie, which really really shocked me, <laughs> because it's, it's very <laughs> rare to see something like that. And, his mother-in-law told him, you need to make a movie that can glorify God or something. And then he was going to give up making more movies because it wasn't a stable job. So, but he said, okay, I'm going to try this one more time. And then, and then people love this movie. So, yeah. um, so have you ever uh, seen anybody that launched their personal project that like getting many people upset. Have I ever seen someone launch a personal project that made many people upset? Yeah, like because they think that it's being too eccentric or extreme or irrational. Um, yeah, I think I have times. Um, most of it's connected to my work, I think. No. <laughs> At the last place where we worked together, I feel like the principal there kind of, you know, launched his own ideas without really considering how it affects other people. Yeah. And I think that I've seen my dad do that on occasion. Okay. Um, I've actually found that I'm very similar to my dad in the way that I do my career path. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, my dad generally is happy with a good majority of the work that he does. But then there'll be like one thing that nags at him or like one person that he doesn't get along with or one problem that he can't solve. <laughs> and eventually over time, it just sort of builds up and he's like, you know what, I'm done. I don't want to stay here anymore. And then we move. <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I used to say my dad hit a GP, you know? <laughs> and I find that I have a similar thing where like, you know, I can't stay in one career too long. When I first moved here, the principal said, I'm looking forward to working with you over the next 15 years. And I got, like, eyes. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that there have been times when my dad has decided he wanted to move when the rest of my family wasn't ready for it and didn't really want to. And that has been difficult. That's one thing that I really could relate to from the perspective of you know, everyone in the movie really, you know, that's one of the things that I think is really difficult about relationships is that when you're making decisions for your career or for where you want to live or what you want to do, it's not just for yourself, it's also affecting people around you. Yeah. And even choosing who you marry, like, you can go in a direction that hurts more people than you realize. Uh-huh. Like, first time that my sister got married, you know, she married a guy that my family wasn't comfortable with. And, you know, his family wasn't really comfortable with our family. And so, like, it just created tension for years. Wow. You know, and that relationship didn't really last. And now she actually, this uh, Christmas, she just got married again. Uh. And before she got married this time, she made sure that her fiancé spent a lot of time with our family. And that everyone in our family had met everyone in his family. And so when they got married, we were all really excited about it because we knew each other and were friends, oh. you know, and we already kind of fit together because like, you know, a lot of those decisions, like marriage, isn't just between two individuals, it's between two families. And um, I think the same thing is true for careers, you know, you think that you're making a choice for yourself, but where you move to or the school district that you put your kid in is going to make a huge difference for them. Um, one of the moves that was difficult for me in my family was when we moved from New York to, Mich to Maine. Because in New York I had friends and I knew kind of what to expect. And then we moved to this whole place where, you know, nobody had moved into the state for years. And like everyone else in my class had been friends since kindergarten and I didn't know how to like fit in or be like a normal person anymore. <laughs> And I don't know that my dad realized that when he decided that we need to move. 
Like I look at the the kids in the movie where they move from California to Arkansas and suddenly they're the only Korean kids like in their in their town. You know, and and how hard it was because their family wanted them to maintain Korean culture and language, whereas they wanted to fit in with their friends, and so they didn't really want to speak Korean as much or eat Korean food or, you know, and like David in particular kept wanting his grandmother to be like a real grandmother, and what he met was an American grandmother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that I could see why the wife wanted to keep the family closer to the Korean community. Because there's a lot that you lose. Yeah. If you don't have that cultural network, I think. Yeah. I think when cultures clash, uh, there is a conformity happening because the, the, the father initially said, yeah, Americans are so dumb. They're trying to look for the source of water with the but two sticks and the water, what, a, what a dumb thing to do. But he had to, mm-hmm. ended up doing it. He even hates people do, to do that after he goes, yeah. through, goes through lots of trouble due to lack of water. Yeah. I actually looked that up when I saw that in the film, and apparently using a dowsing rod is about as good as random chance. Oh. So. The only reason that people think it's effective is that most of the time, if you're in a place that has plants, you're going to find water in the water table eventually. <laughs> so I guess it's uh it's almost like a superstition that they they're using sticks. Oh, definitely. <laughs> they really is. Because when my mom was like trying to find the channel of water or something, assuming that mm-hmm. it's not going to be good for you if you sleep there, I just saw something like that. So I thought it was some sort of like some sort of pseudoscience. But I guess it's a it's, it's superstitious practice. Yeah, at least according to Wikipedia, it is. Yeah, I mean, what can what can two sticks do? How do you feel anything different? Huh? Yeah, um, apparently it's like involuntary motions that you make. <laughs> it's like using a Ouija board, like nothing's moving it it's just you and the other person are making small movements and it feels like someone else is pulling you <laughs> when it's really just the two of you <laughs> yeah, it's like carving a rock and say you're my god and i'm gonna bow down to you and you yeah. better you better give me you more child or something something like that yeah wow so um I don't remember li- relating to my grandma too much, and I feel like the grandma actress is very popular. She was very fun. She is very funny in the movie. Yeah. Um. How did you enjoy the grandma? I liked her character. She had a lot of interesting things to say. I think. Um. I I kind of liked the way that she tried to relate to David, the kid. Um, And I thought it was interesting that she kind of used the technique that you were talking about earlier about taking things and making them positive. You know, like, the kid says, you're not like a real grandmother. And she's like, oh, thank you for complimenting me on how young I look. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. I like... That was probably about the best way that she could have related to him, and you could see that it kind of worked over time. Um, I like that she was treated like a real person and not like a perfect person. And um, like when she had the stroke, that that was really painful to watch. Um, like I've been kind of watching that happen with my grandmother too. The main reason I moved back to the U.S. was to be closer to my grandmother. She's 92 now. Wow. And, um, yeah. Wow. And she used to live um, just across the border up in Oshawa here, which is about seven hours away from me, which is why I moved here. Uh, it was the closest I could get where I could drive, you know, up in a day and see her. Um, but she's just moved in with my family, and it's been really, really tough for her to go from being, like, an independent, strong person who can take care of everything on her own 
to being somebody who has to rely on other people for so many things. And like you could see that happening for the grandmother in the movie. You know, she starts out being able to provide a lot of assistance to the family and like noticing things that are important. And then over time, she really loses the ability to be helpful. And I think that that was really hard for her. And that that really hit home for me because that's one of the things I'm most afraid of. You know, I want to be a useful person. I want to contribute to society. I don't want to be a burden on anyone else. And so I guess remembering that you don't always have a choice about that. You know, and that your worth doesn't come from what you can do or what you can produce. It comes from being a human being. I think that's part of why maybe people like her character. Yeah, the lyric from the movie said that the plot Minari uh, becomes edible after the first batch is cut off or dies away or something. So mm -hmm. it symbolizes the older generation's sacrifice making a way for the next generation to thrive. And mm -hmm. I think grandmother did just that. She go, went to the stream and just planted something that flourished while the headless effort of the father ended up just all being burnt. And she prepared the next step they they had to take so i was just thinking wow old people have so much wisdom young people may not yeah may take for granted mm. i thought it was kind of cool that she ended up being right about david and how he was stronger than they let him be oh that's very true because they told him not to run yeah and he kept running and he got stronger yeah. And she encouraged him that. Uh, what you said actually reminded me of a quote that I read not so long ago from John Adams, uh, where he was saying essentially that he had to study politics and war so that his son could study math and philosophy, and that his son should study math and philosophy so that his kids could study poetry and painting and music. And so I like that idea of like, you try to make life better for the next generation. That's part of why I was drawn to teaching too, is that like, I'm hoping that the lessons that I've had to struggle to learn are lessons that I can pass on so that they don't have to struggle in the same way. And, um, you know, it's like Isaac Newton, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, everything that we learn from the people before us helps us to become the people we are. And um, actually, Joel, Are you using internet? There's something about that too, um, where it talks about the old men having dreams and the young situation in the world is when you have young people having a vision for the future, and you know taking that energy and that passion, and that drive, and moving into something great. But then they're also working together with the old who have dreams of the past, and they understand you know, based on experience and all the knowledge that they've built up over time, what things that they should do. And I think that we really get success when we bring those two things together. Yeah, young and old seem to be a good team to have, not just the old, not just young, the young and old. Yeah, yeah. So is your grandpa still around? No, um, my grandfather actually died when my mom was about 16. My father passed away when I was a, when I was a high school kid. Um, why do you think women love lo live longer? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, Teacher Jeffrey used to say something about that um, for Korea. He said that, you know, if you talk to most of the kids in our high school, at our elementary school, most of them don't have, like, four grandparents or great-grandparents. And it's because, you know, they work so hard to provide for their families that they just sort of work themselves to death or burn themselves out. And I think that there is some truth to that. 
but at the same time, I mean, my grandmother worked extremely hard. And I'm sure if you look back, you can see your mother worked very hard as well. Yeah. And probably still does. So, I don't know. I think... I think it's kind of the providence of God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think doing anything too much, but I mean, it's good to live longer. <laughs> you, you can enjoy yeah. life more. And definitely there is some sort of a law that governs this life. If you take care of yourself, you're going to go longer. And yeah. If you do anything too much, uh, you may pass away earlier. But either way, I think the legacy continues. And the former generation will mm. remember you. So, um, anyway. so what do you think David will remember about the grandma after she passes away? Um, I read an interview somewhere that said that the director pulled a lot from his own experiences yeah. as a child growing up in Arkansas. That he used in the film, and that kind of makes me think that the stuff that was included in the film, stuff that he remembered from his own grandmother. Yeah. Which makes sense because, like, the experiences that we got between David and his grandmother in the movie were all like very emotional ones, mm -hmm. either strong positive or strong negative emotions. And I think that those are the things that I remember most strongly, the things that I have the strongest emotional connections to. Mm -hmm. How about you? What I remember about my grandma and grandpa. Mm. Uh, I just heard that my grandparents took care of me. My grandparents and my father said took care of me and I kept running around the school playground and she had to catch me because I was all over the places. I would disrupt the school assembly and then I would just like took off all the time and she had to chase after me. My mom was working at the, in the city hall. She was a public uh, civil servant and she was working and my grandparents uh, came and actually they just moved in without telling my mom. My dad did all that without telling my mom. So it was very stressful. It was very stressful for my wow. mom. Hey, they just moved in one day. Like, what is that? They're moving in. I'm, <laughs> they're moving in today. I'm just like... So... Um, this lack of communication between one generation to another in Korean culture is very, it's very bad and women can be very, very frustrated and then they have to, uh, that's the toll they have to take. Um, sometimes older generations think that it's okay to just move in like that or do whatever they think they sh should be done. So that's what happened to my family. So. And the another, my father's side grandma, I don't even remember anything about my, my father's side grandpa. My, 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 my dad's grandma lived with us. And she had to jump from one daughter-in-law to another because nobody wanted to take care of her. And then my mom kept getting mad at her. Like, mm. Why do you put your the fake teeth in the cup that people use to brush teeth and yelling at her? and, and I would run errands for her and she would pass away and bury her in the, in the ground and people cry and just all these conflicts between daughters-in-laws and to me, I don't really remember a good dynamic between like daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws mother um, and my, my mom's mom ended up passing away in the nursing home, which she didn't really appreciate because older generation would never put their mother-in-laws or their mothers in the nursing home. They would take care of them until the last breath is taken away. So this generational gap is very painful. Mm -hmm. So I just saw that and, um, but one, one thing I was really amazed at 
the Chinese culture because I visit my wife's family in China and, and in America. They take care of each other very well. So you don't need nursing home. You don't need extra facility to take or like having health care or because family members are your hospitals. They are your nanny. They are your uh, providers. Mm -hmm. They are your therapists. They do everything. So you don't need government. You don't need the insurance company. You don't need any of these. So it's cheap, it's safe, secure, very intimate. So I just saw the benefit of having strong families, what it mm -hmm. means to have that strong connection between two different generations. So I just thought that it's very protective to have that sense of uh, community. It's interesting that you say that. Um... I actually did a study on that when I was in college about, you know, getting old, aging, dying in the U.S. as opposed to Asia. And um, this quote kept coming up in different studies that I read saying that, you know, America is heaven for the young and hell for the old. And mostly because of what you just said that you know, in, in America, they consider your family to be your nuclear family, not your extended family. And so that's, you know, parents and children. So like grandparents and aunts and uncles and everybody else kind of on the outside of that is not considered quite as important. And, you know, that's part of why I think healthcare is so expensive here, but also, you know, in my family, I've seen how difficult it can be to be a caretaker. Um, like I said, my grandmother just moved in with my parents, and so they're being her caretakers now. And she actually wanted to move to a nursing home so she wouldn't be a burden on our family. And we're like, no, like, we want to be there for you. You know, you were there for us when we were young, and now it's our turn. And it's been really difficult for her to accept that. And yeah, right? And yet I can see how hard it is for, for my mom, you know, like she used to be able to go out and do things and talk to people and and now it's it's quite a toll to be at home all the time and to have to learn all these different skills that she didn't know before and so um, I know that having extended family to take care of you is really good and important but also like I can't judge the people who don't do that as harshly as I think I would have before because it's definitely not an easy task Yeah, I think, um, you know, like uh, Jewish worship involved taking the life of innocent animal and you learn the lesson, wow, this is what sin does to somebody else that has nothing to do with my sin. So I think when you see your parents or grandparents losing strength, you see that there must have taken a lot of love and sacrifice for me to even exist and function and breathe so i think i think that's part mm -hmm. of the plan that we're all on we see what gives us strength and what it took for them to even to stay there and i think it goes both ways they mm -hmm. also older generations also need to learn to as you said to accept <laughs> Because probably it's, a bit, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's going to be a precious memory when, when it's all over. Um, mm. Even those seemingly humili humiliating task of being submissive to that servant, <laughs> family servant. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so the, the last question for this interview is... Um, if you would make a movie about your family, what would you like to put a spotlight on? Because there are all kinds of themes you can pick on. Yeah. Oh man, that is a hard question. <laughs> um, I guess for me, I've, I've often wanted to make a movie of my grandmother's life. Because she's an incredible person, you know, she raised her kids 
from, you know, being a teenager on by yourself and make sure that they had, you know, college education and, you know, that they were safe and cared for. And then she moved to Africa and worked there for eight years, you know, all by herself until my parents came to join her and she traveled all around the world. And like everything that I remember of her was service, you know, serving other people, trying to help the cause of God. You know, after she retired, she worked community services faithfully and like she make blankets and all kinds of like baby supplies and things like that for other people. And, you know, everything that she did was always for service. You know, when I was a kid, she was who I wanted to grow to be. But I think I'd also probably want to talk about love, like, and the humility it takes to love somebody truly. Because I think I've seen that in the way that my parents have interacted with my sister and with me. You know, like, there there was a long time when, you know, my sister was with a guy that no one else in my family was comfortable with, where my parents realized that they'd messed up in arguing so much with my sister and wanted to, like, repair the relationship. And from then on, like, they always made a point to value her and their relationship with her more than being right. And that really meant a lot to me when I was a kid and in the way that they dealt with me too, you know, and realizing that the person is more important than the principal, I guess. And I think that that's something that that's worth making a movie about. What about for you? If you had to spotlight like one thing from your family or um, one theme. Actually, I would like to make a movie about what my dad could have done to live longer. <laughs> so I would like to make a fiction based on mm. the potential possible choices he could have made. So he can still be around and what would have taken place. That's something I've always imagined. Mm. And that's something I think would be interesting to look at because that was, that's what, I'm, what is missing my life at this moment so that's what makes it very painful not to have him yeah. around so i think yeah because he worked he worked to death pretty much he worked for the city hall worked mm-hmm. for the government coming home at eight eating dinner together at nine i'm just like it's time to go to bed <laughs> and he's just out there mm-hmm. working and comes home sleeps, go, goes back out. To me, it's nonsense. I mean, like, what's the point of having a family We have to, when you have to work for somebody else so long that you don't even have time or energy for the family? When you say family is the most important thing you can possibly have, mm-hmm. and the world is pressuring you to give that up. So that's why I'm a lot happier these days because I work at home. My first priority is family. Mm-hmm. And... I don't feel like I'm missing too much uh, in my life at this moment. I'm, I feel like I'm living, living the happiest moment of my life because I got my job, mm-hmm. money is coming, I'm having a good time teaching students, I'm making an impact, I see their progress, family is going strong, so I would like to also hope for my kids becoming mm-hmm. that. So, so. I think family is definitely very, very important. And I think the COVID crisis is why this this simple movie is moving a lot of people's hearts. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you also watched it because I because I <laughs> texted yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it was definitely worth my time for sure. And it was nice to be able to listen to Korean again. I missed it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's great. I feel like, I feel like when we were teaching in Yongnam in the middle of nowhere, it, it almost feels like a movie experience where we still wonder: Did that even happen? <laughs> was it was it even real? <laughs> yeah. Well, given how much it changed me, I'd say it's real. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it definitely feels like another lifetime. Yeah, I'm 
I'm glad I was there. I'm glad I wasn't, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> I think one thing that keeps coming up in my mind when you're talking about choices, you know, people always say that everything happens for a reason, but I, I don't really think that that's true. Yeah. I think that like some things happen because of choices that we make or choices other people make. Yeah. But some things I think they just sort of happen randomly because of the world we live in. Yeah, yeah. And I think that oh sorry. Whoa. Um, that's my cat, Darcy. Oh, Darcy. She's been the evening. Normally I'd be playing with them at this time. But anyway. One of the lessons that I've been learning here, if you can see her face. Whoa. Uh, one of the lessons I've been learning is that the things that happen to us aren't really what's important, it's what we do with the things that happen to us. Yeah. And you like I think that when you give them to God, that makes them into beautiful things. Mm -hmm. You know, because he takes the worst things that happen to us, the things that happen for no good reason. Yeah. And he makes them into opportunities for learning and growth. Yeah. And I kinda wish that we had seen a little bit more of that in the movie. Like it it stopped I think before they had an opportunity to really develop that. I was shocked when it ended. I'm just like, what? I thought he was going to be a billionaire. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's and what I mean. mean, there's for that, but yeah. at the same time, it could have happened to anyone. Yeah. yeah. That's what made me keep going back to the script or like reviews to see what what, what is this? <laughs> what, yeah. what, what do I make out of this? Yeah. yeah. I guess the grandma's best intention ended up bringing a curse, but it, it was a blessing eventually. So life is interesting. We yeah. need to make something good out of the mess we create. Yeah. And that's the whole challenge of life right there. Yep. So, wow, it was, it was great to interview you. And I guess the time came for, for the cat to be petted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she would very much appreciate that. <laughs> okay, ho hopefully I can catch up with you again in less than 10 years or 5 years. Sounds good. It was nice talking with you. I hope some of it was useful. Yep, yep. I think it was very enjoyable and full of lessons. And I hope all the best in your teaching career in the, in the battle suite. Thank you, and the same to you. And I hope things go well for you and your family as you figure out the next steps. Thank you very much, Janelle. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.